Hope everybody had a good break. Did everybody have a good break? How many people had a good break? How many people worked on assignments for this class during break? <laughs> and it was still good. Yeah. Um, all right, so today we are going to keep going with memory management. Um, and I hope, uh, so how about this? UB Hackathon. Um, if a 421-521 team wins the hackathon, then I will release one of the exam questions early. Is that fair? What? <laughs> there aren't that many. <laughs> one of the multiple choice questions, right, exactly. The one about the m and M. That's the one I'm going to read. No, uh, no, I'll, no we, we did this We, we had, did this last year. We used some carrots at the end of the year. Last year was for something different. But, but yeah, so if a team wins, I'll release one of the long answer or, or medium answer questions early, and, and everybody can, can know what the question is and have an answer ready, et cetera, et cetera. So how about that for, a, for incentives? You guys should sign up. It's fun. Um, it's, a, it's a fun chance to, you know, get together with a bunch of people and you know, program something up. And you know, if you have a project that's been kind of kicking around in the back of your head, it's a chance to sit down and just you know, devote some good time to it. So I'll probably be there, and I may have something to work on. Um, all right, so on Wednesday, we will hand back the midterms. Midterms are graded. Uh, at some point, figure out how to release the grades, maybe uh, on the website before Wednesday. But if not, then Wednesday in the class. Um, the assignment to autograder is working, so you guys can submit submit your patches and have them be tested. There were some notes released on Piazza about that. Um, because Guru is out of town, um, and I'm hosting a faculty candidate this week, there's a few tweaks to the office hours for the next two weeks. So please check the calendar uh, before you come in. And um, any questions about this sort of stuff? So basically, we guys have you know, roughly a month and a half to finish the rest of the assignments. And there's actually you know, there's a, quite a bit to do. So, um, you know, so I hope you guys are rested. And, and rejuvenated and, and ready to kick some butt on assignment two and assignment three. Yeah, Jeremy. I do know those things, but I'll, I'll well, let's see here. Um, uh, I mean, I, I can, you know, how about this? Why don't we talk about that on Wednesday when we hand back the exams? So on Wednesday, I will also give out the statistics. I think the, the average was pretty good. I think it was, I won't say anything. I, I don't remember exactly. I don't want to frighten people. So we'll, we'll hand back the exams on Wednesday, and summary statistics will be, will be released about the exams and the questions. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right, so today we're going to do a little bit of kind of a, a, a somewhat longish review of memory management because it's been a little while. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about paging and hardware support for uh, efficient address translation. So, does any, <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I find it unlikely that people have questions because how many people remember anything about memory management? So, oh, okay. Uh, so, has, have any questions popped up over break before we go and do a little bit of review? Okay. So, we had these four goals of memory multiplexing. So, we're talking about dividing the memory on the system, there were four things that we were trying to accomplish. Does anyone uh, remember what they are? Well, that's up on the slide. So can anyone describe one of these to me? Yeah, Greg. Uh, memory yeah, so we, we want to, we need to allow processes <laughs> to use the memory on the system. That's a pretty basic requirement of, of multiplexing, right? There is a resource. We're in charge of distributing it, so we need to allow processes to use it. Uh, what about enforcing those allocations? Frank? Uh, yeah, so we need to, to be able to say, if I give a process a certain amount of memory, that it can use that memory, but it cannot use, use other pieces of memory. Uh, what about reclaiming memory? Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to talk about over the next week about ways that the operating system might be able to identify uh, memory, and not necessarily memory that's not being used by a process. This is memory that I've allocated to a process, but maybe the process isn't using it anymore or isn't using it very much. And in certain cases, if I'm on a heavily loaded system, I might need to, I might want to be able to take that memory away in a sort of transparent, sneaky way and give it to another process to use. Another process is going to take better advantage of that resource, right? And what about re revocation? Sean? Uh, to uh, stop using memory permanently, or at least... Uh, 
Yeah, so I should be able to take away, I should be able to take away allocations from a process, right? So uh, this is pretty much uh, what we talked about, okay? Um, and in order to accomplish, so we talked about some of the problems of direct physical, ad, you know, direct physical memory allocation. And we came up with this nice abstraction of an address space, right? So an address space is our memory management abstraction. It's what we're going to try to implement. We've started to talk about some of the challenges in implementing it. But, but what was the goal of an address space? What were some of the things that we liked about the address space abstraction? Uh, you just answered a question. Yeah. Yeah, so we want to, well, it's, it's I, so first of all, we get each process an identical view of memory, right? An identical view of memory regardless of the machine that they're running on, regardless of the time that they're running, regardless of how many copies of that process are running, regardless of what other processes are running on the system, right? So this is a nice thing that makes it easy to write process memory layout and for processes to be able to, to use memory at runtime, right? Your memory, your address space looks the same regardless of whether you're running on one machine or another machine, right? And then one of the things about the address space abstraction was we were able to make memory look uniform. What else were we able to do? Yeah, about that. Yeah, so one thing we, we were able to do is, first of all, make it look like there was a lot of it, right? We can give a process of, we, we had these uh, address spaces we were providing to processes that on your OS 161 system are two gigabytes big, I mean, which is huge, right? I mean, that's, a, that's way more memory than the system has, right? Um, we make it look like it's contiguous, right? So it's all laid out next to each other, which is very nice, despite the fact that that actual address space abstraction is going to end up fragmented all over, all over real memory, right? We'll talk about how that works. That it's uniform, right? That it you know, kind of all behaves in, in roughly the same way. Um, and then it's private, as Bethany pointed out. This is a private abstraction. So there are ways to share memory between processes, but they require explicit coordination and approval by the processes involved, right? Um, so we had, we're, our goal here is we're trying to implement this abstraction. So we had this nice abstraction and these great features. We want to make it work, right? And clearly what we discovered is that there's no way to implement that without breaking, breaking the direct connection between physical, uh, between memory addresses and physical memory, right? So we have to put something in between. What was this, uh, what was this level of indirection that we, that we came up with, Remo? Question is, I can't, give pro I can't give processes physical addresses anymore. I can't allow them to use physical addresses. So what am I going to allow them to use? Virtual addresses, right? So I'm going to introduce the idea of virtual addresses that require translation, right? So a virtual address doesn't necessarily point to a specific physical address. It's up to the kernel to translate it. We talked about some of the nice things that this allows us to do, right? So if I give out references rather than you know, direct access to an object, I can revoke the references. That's one of the things I wanted to do in order to uh, multiplex memory, right? I can share references, and there's some clever things that the operating systems will do to try to identify cases where sharing can be done safely, right? Remember, we don't want, you know, uh, we need to preserve the privacy of the address space abstraction. So we might be able to share pages, but we need to make sure that the, doing that doesn't violate any of the guarantees that we're trying to establish, right? I can move things around, and that's actually going to consume us for the next couple of weeks, is talking about when memory stops, when, when virtual addresses stop pointing to memory, what do they point to, and how do I use that ability to move things around behind this reference to allocate physical memory more efficiently. And finally, I can also alter the object behind them without, without changing the reference. Right? Uh, what's the interface to memory? This is an interesting question people usually don't think about. Wembley. Load and store, right? This is not an interface that's provided by <coughs> the operating system, right? This is a hardware interface. This is an interface that's provided by the CPU, right? These are instructions that the CPU will execute on your behalf, right? But what we do with virtual addresses is we change this interface, we change the semantics, we make it much richer, right? And the operating system participates in this, right? All right, so we talked about virtual addresses. A so when we talk about physical and virtual addresses, just to review, a physical address points to memory. Right? A physical address refers to a, you know, a specific byte of physical memory on the machine right? that holds a value and, and is you know, cleared it, you know, is able to be loaded and sorted and loaded and sorted. Um, load and stored, I don't even know how to say that, I'm just going to stop trying. Um, we're able to load and store to it and it you know, powers off at runtime. And a virtual address points to something that obeys the memory abstraction but isn't necessarily actually memory. Right? And again, we talked about how using virtual addresses 
allows us to layer on a bunch of additional semantics to, to physical addresses, uh, to memory addresses, which we liked, right? All right, so who can tell me how base and bounds mapping works? So now we have this abstraction, right? We have an address space abstraction. We've discovered that the way to implement it is by introducing this level of indirection into our memory addresses themselves, right? So we've come up with this idea of a virtual address. Now the problem is, how do we translate this quickly, right? What happens if every translation, uh, you know, let's say we had an architecture that required every memory address to be explicitly translated by the kernel. How, what, what would that architecture be like? Slow. Really slow. Yeah, like unusably slow, right? Um, so that would not be good. Um, but so what we want is, we, remember, we have this nice, uh, we've talked about in this class, one of the design principles that operating systems try to adhere to is the separation between mechanism and policy. So we want, the mechanism here is the actual process of translation. The policy is how the translation should happen. And what we want is we want a way for the hardware to allow the operating system to set the policy that's used to translate addresses without having to translate every single address by itself. Right? So the hardware is going to provide the mechanism. Operating system is going to provide the policy. Right? So base and bounds uh, address translation. This was the first uh, and one of the simplest approaches to address translation we talked about. How does it work, Kevin? need a base address, right? And what else do I need? There's, there's two things I need to tell the hardware memory management unit, right? The base address is one of them, right? What's the other one? Guru. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I need a base and a bound, right? I need a base address, right? And, a, and I need a bound, OK? So I assign each process a base fill address and a bound. That this determines essentially the amount of memory that this process is allowed to use. Right? We're talking about a single base and bounds per process. How do I translate an address? AJ. OK. How do I do that? Well, remember here, so there, there, this is similar to segmentation, right? But how, in, in base and bounds addressing, how do I check if an address is valid? It's a little bit, it's even simpler than you think. Jeremy? Check the virtual address against the base. <laughs> check the virtual address against the base. Does anyone else have a different theory? Wembley. Check the virtual address the bounds. Yeah, remember that the, the idea here is that the, the, the <laughs> base virtual address for every process is assumed to be zero, right? Um, the base, is a, the base here is a physical address, right? So the bound, all I do is I check if the virtual address is OK by just checking if it's less than the bound. How do I translate the virtual address, right? So now I have a virtual address that's OK. How do I complete the translation? Bethany? Add it to the base physical address. I add it to the base physical address, OK? So what's nice about this? It's simple, right? Uh, what's bad about it? What does this require about my address spaces? Let's say, remember, I wanted to give each process this really nice, huge view of memory. So if I give each process a two gigabyte address space, how big does the physical address space that I have to give it, how big does that have to be? Yeah, so now, now, I'm, now I, you know, I, I'm really not able to, to provide one of the things I wanted to provide about my address space abstraction. Right. Base and bounds means that you know, the, the bounds is the same for virtual, the virtual addresses and for the physical addresses. So the size, in order to implement an address space abstraction, the size of the address space determines the amount of contiguous physical memory I have to give every process. Right? So either I have to make the address spaces very small, which I don't want to do, or I have to have a huge amount of memory on the system. Right? And remember, this is happening in like 1960. Okay? So you didn't have a huge amount of memory on the system. Teeny, teeny, teeny little. Okay, so this is not this is not good, right? 
Uh, and, this, and this also leads to a lot of internal fragmentation because the address space abstraction encourages processes to spread out, right? To use a lot of the, you know, let the heap start here and let the stack start a gigabyte above the heap in virtual address space, right? In in, now in the physical address space, that whole gigabyte is wasted, right? Because most of it's never going to be used, okay? So, so we, we extended this idea, right? So we said, okay, this isn't a good fit for the address space abstraction because it doesn't address the sparsity of address spaces, right? Most virtual address spaces in my address space abstraction are not ever going to be allocated, right? If you look at virtual address spaces, there are huge, you know, you look at my address space, there's huge swaths of it that are never used, right? And then little bits of data, little bits of code, little bits of stack, right? So how can we extend this idea to better, better match that abstraction? Yeah, so I came up with this idea of segmentation, right? I like base and bounds. The comparison and the translation are very easy and very easy to do in hardware, right? But instead of one base and bounds, which is bad, I just say I can have an arbitrary number of base and bounds per process. Then we call each one of them a segment, right? Um, and we, now what we can do is we can essentially take this address space, which is extreme, again, remember, it's extremely sparse. Most of it is unused. And we can cover it with a number of segments, right? And now the total amount of physical address space, physical memory that I give to the process is essentially more of a reflection of how much of its virtual address space it's actually using, right? I don't have to cover the large areas that aren't allocated, right? I can just take four or five or six segments and use them to cover the parts that are in use, right? Um, and each one can, can grow and shrink independently. Each one can be protected differently. Um, so now each segment, remember, I, I took the base and bounds idea and I had to add one additional thing, right? So now I need to know the base and bounds we always assume started at virtual address zero. With segments, I, don't, I can't make that assumption. So the segment I need to know where it starts in the virtual address space, where it should be mapped to in the physical address space, and the size, right? So I have a starting virtual address, a base physical address, and a bound, okay? Then my translation works as follows. I see if, there, if that virtual address falls inside of some segment that's been defined for the process. If it does, then I can translate it by taking the offset within that segment and applying it to the physical address, right? So I figure out what's the offset inside the segment by subtracting off the segment start in virtual address space, and thus I apply that to the physical address, right? So in case people don't remember how this works, we can run through our example again, right? So what happens when I, the process tries to translate address 10,000. I want to call somebody has it. Yeah. OK, an exception, right? Why? Tau. Right, because the MMU knows nothing, right? Like, this is the sum total of the MMU's in, uh, you know, knowledge about the world, right? Um, so it says, I don't know how to translate this address, right? So it asks the kernel, right? Now let's say this, uh, so what does the kernel need to tell the MMU now in order to allow it to translate this segment? Tim. Well, there were three things associated with the segment, right? The three pieces of data that the MMU is going to need to translate this address. Alyssa. Right, so I need, I need to know where, I need to know a base address, right? So I need to know where is this in physical memory. What else do I need to know? Yeah. Start address and the bound. Right, so the bound, which Alyssa got, and the start address in the virtual address space, right? So I tell it, the kernel tells the MMU, yes, in fact, there is a segment, right? So the MMU at this point doesn't know whether this is a valid address or not. What the kernel is going to tell it is, Yes, MMU, this is a valid address. There's a segment for this process that starts at virtual address 10,000. It's located in memory at physical address 43,000 and at a size 1,000. So here's something else I want to point out that we didn't really talk about last time. How many addresses, so when we started this example, how many addresses did the MMU know how to translate? Zero, right? How many does it know how to translate now? 10,000. Oh, 1,000. 
a thousand, right? The, every address within this segment can now be translated without causing an exception, right? So this is something you want to think about when you think about how this works. Because we've caused this exception, right? We didn't want to cause exceptions, right? But in certain cases, there's no other way around it, right? The MMU has no idea what's, what's happening. It doesn't know how to do this. But now the nice thing is the kernel has just told the MMU with three, you know, with just three pieces of information how to translate a thousand different virtual addresses, right? So, and, you know, assuming that this process is going to use other addresses inside that segment, then all those addresses cannot be translated without, without requiring that the MMU ask the kernel for help, right? So again, now I know how to translate this. I can find this in physical memory, and I can complete the, you know, the loader store. How many people remember how this works now? OK, let's, let's do another one, right? So what happens here? Goes to the kernel, asks for help. The kernel tells it, here's another segment. So how many addresses does the MMU know how to translate now? 1,500, right, for two exceptions. It's pretty good, right? Um, and remember that um, the other thing that's going to happen here is that a lot of times, so, so let me ask you a question. When a, when a process is running, right, if you looked at the stream of addresses that a process is, is accessing, do you think those, that stream is just completely randomly distributed all over the address space? What, what would you say? What do you think? That's in your intuition about how processes work. Jeremy. Well, I'm not even talking about allocation. I'm just saying, let's say you were sitting here in the MMU and you were just watching for a particular process, right? And you, know, you were just looking at the addresses it was using, and you, and you just kind of mapped them into its virtual address space, into, its, you know, into the address space that it's using. Do you think those, like, would you see sprinkles of addresses all over the place? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm only talking about addresses translated by this process. Yeah. Maybe the same ones. OK, so that's the start of an answer. Yeah, why? Yeah, OK, that's good. We're, we're getting warmer here. Well, it, OK, so the process will use the same virtual addresses, but I'm saying like more on a temporal basis, right? So for, first of all, what, what provides at least one stream of addresses that the MMU needs to translate, right? So loads and stores from memory provide some indication of where the data is that the program is using. But what provides another stream of, of virtual addresses that the MMU needs to translate? Mukta. Yeah, what about fetch, right? Fetches and executes. So when you start thinking about the code that the process is executing, right? First of all, it all kind of lives in the same part of it, right? But, but what's the usual cycle when a, when a process is running? Right? How does how does the how is the program counter normally manipulated at runtime? This is like a computer organization review, right? What's the typical cycle for the pro when the, that the processor is going through, right? Fetch decode, and execute. Fetch, decode, and execute, and then in the normal case, unless I'm doing a jump, what do I do? What? No, no, no. I fetch, decode, execute, and then where's the next instruction I'm going to execute? Manish. Yeah, it's the program counter plus four, right? Unless I do a jump, right, I'm just, you know, linearly moving through the, you know, the code, right? And there are jumps in your code, right? That's how you do program flow. But the idea here is that processes exhibit a fair amount of locality, right? Address locality. So the idea here is that Let's say I'm running some loop, right? And that loop is located in this piece of code. Let's say there's code here, right? So now, not only have I told the CPU, the MMU, how to you know, translate 1,000 addresses, I might sit there you know, executing like 20 of those addresses over and over and over and over again, right? I'm in a loop that you know, the, the loop count is like 1,000 or something. I'm going to sit there 
spinning in this tiny, tiny little bit of code. And the nice thing is the MMU never needs to ask the kernel again how to translate those addresses. Right? So one of the things that helps us here is locality. Right? I wish I had some statistics about locality to show you guys. But, but assuming that processes exhibit good locality, these types of address translations can be quite efficient. Right? Because you know, if it was jumping all over the place, right, I'd have to be constantly telling the MMU about new regions of addresses. And we're going to talk about paging today, which makes this even a little bit worse. Right? All right, so yeah, we decided to kill the process because it tried to address Debbie, even though Debbie is a perfectly OK address. OK, so any questions about this before we talk about, uh, before we talk a little bit more about segmentation and then introduce a new idea? Any questions about segmentation in particular? Yeah. <laughs> How do, okay, so great question. How do processes decide what is the physical address? Who thinks they can answer that question? No, Jeremy, I'm going to ignore you. Frank. Yeah, the, so the process never knows the physical address. So what does this mean about the process's decision about what physical addresses to use? Yeah, great. It doesn't make a decision about it. Right? It doesn't know. Right? If it doesn't know, it can't make a decision. The process doesn't get to say, hey, I would like that piece of physical memory over there. It, it never knows. It doesn't know anything about physical memory. Right? All the addresses processes ever use are virtual addresses. Right? Processes never see physical memory. OK, it's a good question. Any other questions? Oh, how the, OK, good. OK, <laughs> fair. How does the kernel decide how to allocate physical memory? We haven't discussed that yet, but we, but we will. Yeah? Uh, it knows the amount of memory that this process requires. Right. And it finds the segments which are available, which is the maximum available segment, which would satisfy the memory. Yeah, so, so first of all, when you start, so this is, a, this is a good review, right? So where do a lot of addresses come from, right? Where's, what's one time during a program's execution where it tells the operating system about a lot of different parts of the vi vir virtual address space that it's going to use? When does this happen? I hear muttering, but no answers. Paul? Does it know? Uh, I want to call, pick on somebody new. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, when does that when does that happen? Can we be more specific? That's correct. Nathan, when does that happen? What I call exec. Exec is tells the kernel, here's this blueprint of how I want my address space to be laid out, right? And here's a file that contains a fair amount of the contents that I want you to put into my address space form. Right? That file has this L format that you guys are Going to learn a little bit about for assignment two. Not a huge amount, but a little bit. Right? So there's this blueprint, and the, ad, uh, oper the program tells the operating system, here's how I want my address space laid out. OK? So at that point, the program is essentially telling the operating system, I need a, a segment of this size, I need a segment of this size, I need a segment of this size. Right? So the operating system knows what physical memory is allocated and has to somehow figure out where to find segments of that size. Right? So you know, this is essentially an allocation problem. Right? It's quite similar to the types of allocation problems that are solved by things like malloc. Right? We're actually going to, so I'm going to come back to your question, because we're going to talk about today an approach that makes this allocation problem much easier, right? that, that avoids some of the fragmentation problems. But in general, the operating system needs to keep track of the physical memory that's been allocated. And when it receives a request for memory, it needs to find an area of physical memory that it can use to satisfy that allocation. Right? This is a good question. Any other questions? And you guys will write this for assignment three. For assignment three, you guys will be in charge of keeping track of what memory is allocated on the system. Right? And you will have to figure out how to do this. Right? Your, your system right now doesn't keep track of it at all. Right? That's why it runs out of memory and dies. Right? It, it keeps no track. Right? You guys will be in charge of making sure that, that you, can, you can track and reuse allocations. Right? But there's a nice idea that we'll talk about today that makes this a little bit easier. Okay? All right, so we came up with this idea of segmentation. And segmentation seems pretty nice, right? It seems like I have this nice uh, abstraction. I can use it. Um, it's, it's a nice balance between base and bounds, the simplicity of base and bounds, but it, it, it meets the features of the address space that I wanted, right? It gives me a, a way to allocate only the parts of the address space that are actually used, right? So that's kind of nice, right? Um, 
the, the, and we look at, if you think about the pros of segmentation, right? So I can, segments are pretty, still fairly simple. I mean, base and balance are simpler, right? But base and balance also don't do, do, do we want, right? So with segments, um, the translation requires one addition. So I have to find, the, you, think about it, you have to think about what the hardware has to do, right? The hardware has to be able to keep track of an, some number of segments, right? It's going to be a fixed number because this is hardware, right? <laughs> so hardware needs to be able to, to keep track of a certain number of segments. When it translates its address, it needs to find the segment that that address is in, and then the translation takes one, you know, one addition, right? So essentially, you know, the hardware does, needs to do a search somehow through all the segments that it knows about, and then it needs to, once it finds the right segment, assuming the segment exists and it doesn't need to interrupt the kernel, it needs to perform one addition, right? And again, the nice, you know, segments are a nice concept, right? So for example, when you guys, you know, if you guys have write, written C programs before, you've seen this error about a segmentation violation, right? A lot of modern operating systems, despite the fact that they utilize a technique called paging, which we're going to talk about today, to actually translate memory, still organize the address space into segments, right? Segments are kind of a conceptual idea that allows me to say, this segment is code, this segment is data, because usually a segment has permissions that are the same, right? So a, a data segment may be read-write, a code segment may be read-only, right? Um, and this was also a nice fit for our address spaces. It, le it led to less internal fragmentation, right? So it would, based on balance, there was this huge amount of memory in the address space that was wasted. And with segments, I got away with this, right? But there are still some problems with segments, OK? One of them is that, if you think about it, the segment, the whole segment still has to be resident in memory. So the operating system's decision is now, you know, sh you know, first of all, as segments get big, I have to find large amounts of contiguous memory, right? So let's say that a process has a heap, and I found a nice space for it in between a couple of other allocations. And then it says, I want to extend my heap, right? I want some more space because you know, I'm running this really cool algorithm. I've just allocated a bunch of big data structures using malloc, right? Well, now the kernel has to find it a whole another piece of contiguous physical memory, right? And that can become difficult, right? There, there, I might have this, you know, in external fragmentation problem, right, where I have pieces of memory, right, that add up to an amount that's large enough to satisfy the allocation, but I don't have a contiguous piece. Now, what could I do if I was the kernel? Let's say I had this problem, right? I had a segment that somebody tried to grow, and I couldn't grow it because it was penned in by other segments on either side of it. What could I do? Right? Somebody asked about this last time. What, what do I have the power to do, right? Remember, I've introduced these virtual addresses. That's fantastic, right? So now, I, what, what can I do to, all of, to any allocation on the system? Yeah, Varun. Yeah, so I could say, hey, you know, I'm going to like run some sort of compacting algorithm on my, you know, on my memory, right? So I'm going to take all the allocations out there. I'm going to start moving them around, right? But what do I have to do in order to move them? I have to change the virtual to physical mappings, but what else do I have to do? This is important. Well, yeah, I mean, I need to make sure that they don't try to change it. But, but again, what it, I, I wish it was that simple, right? I wish all you had to do was change the virtual to physical addresses. But what else do I have to do? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's not. That's going to be very easy, too. Yeah. I have to copy the data, right? I can't just. Like, let's say I had a segment of data over here that somebody had, had written some really important data into. I can't just move it, to, you know, change the mappings and say, hey, use that memory over there. I have, to I have to make the contents the same, right? That would be really unfortunate for processes if when I moved their allocations around, the contents changed, right? That, that would break the guarantee I wanted about memory, right? Virtual addresses are supposed to act like memory. So when I do a load, after I did a store, it's supposed to be the same thing. So if I start moving allocations around, I have to do all this copying in, in physical memory, right? Which is, you know, not necessarily terrible. I might have to do it sometimes, but it, it starts to sound kind of terrible. I guess I said it wasn't terrible, but it's kind of terrible, right? You know, it, it's potentially high overhead to start moving segments around in memory, right? 
And I still, again, I still have this problem, right? I have this external fragmentation. I wish I had a graphic for this, right? But I could have cases where, you know, I've got a bunch of segments allocated and I have space in between them, but I can't, alloc I can't satisfy a new segment allocation without moving all these segments around, which is a potentially pretty high overhead thing to do. Yeah, Jeremy. Would you also, if you're moving segments, would you have to find uh, pieces that are to Yeah, but you can imagine, like, if I had a badly fragmented, I mean, this is very similar to how disfragmentation works, right? If I had a badly fra fragmented memory space, I could stop all the processes and just carefully rewrite all the se segments to the beginning of memory and, and give myself, like, one big contiguous piece that I could use then, right? But that would also be slow. So let's, let's take a step back, right? So really the reason why we started this is we wanted a way to map virtual addresses, right? And we started talking about ways to do this that would kind of be a, a reasonable approach given hardware capabilities, right? So we know that hardware is going to have to do most of this itself, right? I still want to be able to tell hardware how to do it, and I don't want to have to hard tell hardware too often, right? But Ideally, what I would love is to just be able to flexibly allocate any byte in my virtual address space to any physical byte, right? <laughs> so we know that the operating system can't do this, right? Um, and what we've been talking about are ways that the hardware can assist us, okay? Um, and, you know, on some level, we've been talking about the MMU up until this point as this kind of cache, right? So the MMU has been caching these address translations, right? The MMU asks the kernel for the first time it doesn't know something about how to translate a virtual address. And then in the future, assuming that it understands how to translate that virtual address, it doesn't have to ask the kernel again, right? And this is a common trick that we use in operating systems, right? If there's a big thing that's slow, right, or a certain type of process that's slow, in the general case, what we try to make it is faster in a specific set of cases. You know, and one, one way of thinking about operating systems and computer systems in general is computer systems are a series of caches, right? So, you know, the disk is a cache for memory, which is a cache for the L3 cache. Wait, sorry, I'm going backwards. Registers are a cache for the L1 cache, which is a cache for the L2 cache, which may be a cache for the L3 cache, which is a cache for memory, which is a cache for your disk, right? Like, that's how it works, right? And the speed, you know, that I can access those different caches goes, you know, gets slower and slower and slower as they get bigger, right? Registers are the fastest thing on your system to access. You only have a few of them. The disk is the slowest thing to access. You have a huge amount of disk, right? So specifically, the piece of hardware I'm going to use here is something called a translation look-aside buffer. How many people have heard of, have, know about TLBs already? Eh, okay, a handful, right? So. Um, what, what TLBs are is a form of what's called content addressable memory. Um, and TLBs allow hardware to look up address translations fairly quickly. And we're going to use TLBs to implement a, to implement a new idea, which is, which is called paging, right? So hold on a sec. I think I might have gotten ahead of myself here. Uh, OK. So. Uh, Okay. Yeah, let me go forward and see if. Uh, ah, okay. So let's talk about pages, and then we'll talk about. This is a little bit backwards, right? We'll talk about pages, and then we'll talk about how we can use the TLB to, to implement pages, right? So. So our problem with segments is that segments. Um, segments allow us to map fairly efficiently, right? But they can get too big, right? And what? So here's the other problem, right? If I have a, let's say I have a data, the, the uh, program has a portion of its address space that it's using in, as a heap, right? Or for data or for its code or something. That's going to all be one segment. So the operating system essentially has to find a piece of physical memory for that segment, right? But what, what's also true about that segment in memory is, is every part of that segment going to be equally used? Let's say I have a segment that has all my code in it as every piece of code the operate, that the program could possibly use. What percentage of the code that a program could possibly execute is it probably executing in any, in any given point in time? A large amount? Small amount? Yeah, I mean, there's like features of the programs you guys use that you've probably never activated. Right? That you've never used and never know how, will never use, right? 
you know, features of you know, Microsoft Word that like, are, six, are buried in six different submenus, right? And, and that, that part of the code space you're never going to use, right? So now I've got this big blob of code that's sitting in physical memory, and only a small amount of it is, is in active use. So what kind of fragmentation is this? It's internal, right? Because I have this big allocation. It's sitting there in physical memory. I can move it, right? I might be able to remove it from physical memory and put it somewhere else. But what's true about the segment abstraction? I have to move the whole thing, right? So if I have a big piece of code, and let's say I, you know, I say, well, I want to reclaim that memory, so I'm going to copy that, that uh, piece of memory somewhere else. But as soon as the um, program tries to use an address inside the segment, I have to get the whole segment back into memory. Right? regardless of whether or not it's using big pieces of it. So I have this internal fragmentation problem. Right? So segments are kind of too big, right? but if I started mapping individual bytes, what would, ha what would happen? Let's say, I, let's say I decided that my segments are going to be one byte in size. Right? I can do that. You know, the bound is one for every segment. Right? There's a base virtual address, and there's a physical address. So, so I basically what I'm doing is I'm telling the hardware how to map addresses one at a time. What would happen? Remember we talked about before, I interrupt the kernel, the kernel tells me something, and then I can run for a while, right? What would this mean? Bethany? Well, then instead of one instruction being able to map 1,000 addresses, you have one instruction mapping one address, which takes a lot more time and a lot more space. You know. Yeah, so remember, the hardware can only store a fixed number of these translations, right? So let's say the hardware can store 32 translations, and each segment is 1,000 bytes, is on average 1,000 bytes. So now I can map 32,000 bytes of the virtual address space without requiring the kernel's help. Now I make the segments one byte, right? So how many bytes can I map now? 32, right? If I'm lucky, the process is sitting in a teeny weeny little loop, right? That access is like 16 memory addresses, but that's not very common, right? So is, is the segment, you know, is the size of the uh, amount, you know, essentially if you think about it, what we're doing is we're telling the uh, MMU how to map regions of addresses, right? As those regions get small, the number of times the MMU has to ask for help goes up, right? As those regions get really big, the internal fragmentation that occurs inside those regions gets, gets bad, right? Does this make sense? This is kind of like the, the, the big trade-off that's involved in memory management, right? As the regions get small, I have to tell the hardware all the time what to do, right? As the regions get big, I have huge chunks of physical memory that have to be resident, right? Because any address inside of them could be being used because the hardware knows how to translate it, but large portions of it are not going to be used, right? So what we do is we come up with something. We try to choose a fixed granularity, right? What we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to try to choose a middle ground, you know, a middle ground that's, what we want is a unit of virtual memory that's big enough that the hardware can translate large amounts of virtual address space efficiently, but small enough that there's not too much internal fragmentation that's going to take place, right? The other thing is, by choosing a fixed size, right, we're also going to choose a fixed size, right? We're going to say, you know, essentially every segment has a fixed size, right? So we're not allowing segment size to vary anymore, right? What's nice about having fixed size segments? What does that make easy? There was this problem before that we had about what that we're going to be able to solve now. Yeah. It makes kernel allocation really easy, right? Because remember before I had this problem where if my segment size changed, I might have to move it and move other things around, right? Now my segment size never changes. So what, I go, what I'm doing is I'm allocating fixed units of memory. Right? I break up the memory into fixed units. And I can, if I have a fixed unit of allocation, I can never have external fragmentation. Yeah. Does that mean that you don't have to store the bounds of the password? It does mean that. right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the bound is fixed. Right? So the hardware doesn't have to know the bound. Right? That also makes translation a little bit, little bit easier. Right? So now let's go back and talk the t about the TLB. I'm sorry I got this backwards. I don't know why I ever thought this made sense this way. Um, so, so, right, so the, the nice thing here is, is we can use this content addressable memory in a clever way in order to do this virtual to physical translation, right? So, 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to identify areas of virtual and physical memory by their, what we call them, we call them page numbers, right? So I take physical memory, I divide it up into a fixed size, right? It doesn't matter what the fixed size is for this example. Right? It could be anything. It could be a byte, it could be a thousand bytes, but it's fixed, okay? Now the nice thing is, what I care about is what page of virtual memory is this particular address in, right? And it turns out on modern systems, usually I use a page size of either 4K or 8K. The nice thing about using a power of two, it allows me to lop off some bits to get the page number, right? But let's say, let's say I'm doing this, right? So I have a, a virtual address that comes in, right? And it's in page 800. What content addressable memory allows me to do, right? This is what TLBs are very efficient at. What content addressable memory does, it essentially searches all of the entries in this buffer in parallel. So there's a fixed cost to kind of, and again, you can just, you can read about TLBs and hardware if you're curious about how this is actually implemented, right? But the idea with the TLB is that there's a fixed cost for looking up this address in the TLB, and in some sense, it is searching all the addresses in parallel in hardware, right? So what's going to happen is it's going to match to this address, right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say virtual page 800 for this process maps to physical page 306. This is how I use this particular uh, feature of hardware to help me translate uh, page numbers, right? I want to slow down a little bit because I feel like I've bewildered maybe some people. So, so again, be because we have this problem with CAMs, right, we're going to... Um, we're, we're going to, to, to choose a fixed segment size that's big enough to allow this to occur. So, for example, I could have done this on bytes, right? Let's pretend that we've decided that we're going to translate byte to byte, right? A byte of virtual address to a byte of physical address, right? So again, here's my virtual to physical mappings. How many bytes of memory does this CAM know how to translate? Four, right? And in, and in modern systems, I think CAMs are usually limited to maybe like a thousand addresses, right? The, the, the size of this particular piece of hardware scales exponentially with the number of addresses that it's able to translate, right? So you can't just make one of, I mean, it would be great if you could make huge content addressable memories, right? They'd be really useful for a lot of things, right? But it turns out that to make them fast, the, the, the complexity of the CAM scales exponentially with the number of addresses. So we can't make them arbitrarily large. So if, let's say my, again, let's say my segment, my fixed segment size is one byte, so there's four bytes that this, that this TLB knows how to translate. So let's say I wanted to use this TLB to translate 16 bytes. How would I do that? Yeah. Yeah, so if this, if each one of these addresses identifies four bytes of memory, right, now my CAM can translate 16 bytes of memory, right? Let's say I wanted it to translate 32 kilobytes of memory. How big would each segment have to be? This is fairly simple math. 8K, right? If each one of these uh, virtual uh, segments is 8K, now I can translate 8K worth of, worth, of, uh, worth of memory, right? So, okay, so we talked about pages, right? The, the nice thing that, pages, that page sizes also do is uh, fixing a page size also limits the size of <coughs> kernel data structures that are associated with managing uh, memory, right? Because if you imagine I, so if I have my virtual address space, let's say my virtual address space is four gigabytes and I break it into 4K pages, how many, what's the maximum number of pages that could be present in a given process's address space? Like a million, roughly, right? And the other thing that helps, so the thing that we come back to that helps us here too, right, is that execution locality and process locality really makes this work, right? Because the, the hardware is never going to be able to translate large portions of the process address space, right? It just becomes too inefficient to do it quickly in hardware, right? There's a trade-off in hardware between the amount of address space I can translate and the speed at which I can perform each individual translation. 
So what I've done is I've came up with a compromise, but again, the nice thing here is that most processes, you know, they, they do jump around within their address space, but you know, while they're executing, they're basically loading and storing from the same thing, and then they might jump, and I might have to reload a new translation, and then they're going to execute there for a while, and then they might jump somewhere else. But there's a fair amount of, of memory locality, right? So as I said before, 4K is a very, very common page size, right? Nobody really knows why this is true, right? Uh, this page size was picked probably in the 1970s. Um, and, but, you know, it seems pretty robust. Like, there are some systems now that are using 8K pages or sometimes even larger pages, like 64K pages. I think some systems have support for much bigger pages. I mean, modern systems have a lot more memory than they used to, right? So it's kind of interesting that we're still using roughly the same page size, right? But, but there hasn't been a huge amount of change in this. Um, so again, if you imagine that I have 4K pages and I have 128 entry TLB, now I can cache translations for a megabyte of virtual memory, right? That's pretty, and that's pretty good, okay? And again, we think of pages as fixed size segments, right? I think, do I have an example here? Ah, okay. So now how, so now how do we do page translation? So let's walk through this and then, and then we'll be done for the day, I think. So I'm gonna break up my address space into, oh, let me just get through this, and then I'll let you guys go. And we'll, we'll come back to this on, on Wednesday. So I'm breaking up my address space into fixed-sized pages. I'm breaking up physical memory into fixed-sized pages, OK? Every virtual page in my address space that's valid maps to a physical page. Or it might be somewhere else. But the point is that if I'm using it, it has to be in memory somewhere. And there's a page-to-page -page mapping, right? Remember, essentially, I'm thinking of everything now in units of 4K, right? 4K of memory. So if I'm going to translate an address inside a page, it turns out that the page number of a 32-bit address is now just the top 20 bits, right? Again, these are fixed size segments. The bottom 12 bits identifies the offset into my fixed size segment or my page, right? The top 20 bits identifies the virtual page number, right? So what I do, and we're going to talk about address, we're going to talk about different data structures to do this, right, is the kernel. If the MMU doesn't know whether or not this virtual page is valid, it's going to ask the kernel. And the kernel has to figure out if there's a physical page translation for this virtual page. Right? So we're going to talk about data structures for doing this. Right? And now what I do is I look up the physical page. I take the physical address. I take the physical page number. And I, and I add on that offset. Right? So this is very much like segmentation. Right? This is like segmentation with a fixed segment size, which is 4K. Right? It just turns out that because the segment size is 4K, I can do this fancy you know, bit masking to do what I want to do. Right? This is essentially like taking this and subtracting off the offset and then re-adding it. Right? But I can do it using, using bit masks. Right? OK, so on Wednesday, we'll start with this example. And uh, we'll get through paging. And we'll talk about some kernel data structures that are used to make paging more efficient.